All right, we are back in Psalms today. Like I said, a 3,000-year-old psalm. I mean, most of the psalms are about 3,000 years old. Um, this psalm poses a question. And so I'm really interested to explore how this psalm both asks a question, which is still one of the most important questions we can ask today, and then to see how does this psalm answer that question that it poses. So uh, let me first, in fact, let me read the psalm for you, then we'll pray and then we'll see what God would have for us. This is Psalm 15, the first part at least. Lord, who can dwell in your tent? Who can live on your holy mountain? That's the question. Here's the answer. The one who lives blamelessly, practices righteousness and acknowledges the truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue, who does not harm his friend or discredit his neighbor, who despises the one rejected by the Lord, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps his word when, whatever the cost, who does not lend his silver at interest or take a bribe against the innocent. The one who does these things will never be shaken. All right, it's a pretty tough list. So we need to ask God for his help today, uh, both in understanding, but then also in applying. So uh, let's ask. Father, again, we want to thank you for these scriptures. <clears throat> thank you for David, who wrote them down, uh, inspired by your spirit. Thank you that we can read them today, that you want us to understand these words. And so help us to have open hearts and minds to these scriptures and to your spirit speaking to us today. Help us to understand and put into practice the things we read for your glory and for our joy in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we read the Psalms, uh, we, the, the basic way we're approaching it, like foundational way is, how do we understand the Psalm as it would have been understood in its day by the original readers and even singers of this Psalm? And how are we to understand it in light of Christ? And so that's basically what we're going to try to do now. And David, King David, poses this question, who, who can ascend the hill? Who can approach God? Who can live with him? Who can dwell in his tent? It's actually a question that's asked a few times in the Psalms. How, how is it possible that we can do this? We mere mortals, we humans, we seemingly insignificant, here today, gone tomorrow, vaporous kind of... Whew, there was the breath of our life, here and then gone. How are we supposed to approach an eternal, holy, majestic, purely volitional being who created everything we know with his breath? How can we do this? And in the answer we see there is a right way. In fact, there is an only way that we can approach the king. There's an only way we can approach this God, and it is on his terms. Now, I know uh, among the people who call City Light Plimpton their kind of their church family, I know we have a couple of people who have met Queen Elizabeth when she was still alive. And when you meet royalty in our day, you may be aware of this, there is a very strict protocol of how you are to do it, what you can and can't say, how you're supposed to dress, how you carry yourself, um, all those kinds of things. In fact, <clears throat> when you're officially meeting the Queen, you don't really approach her at all, but she has to first come to you. Uh, we in Australia, especially in 2023, uh, we don't like this kind of formality. When I met the Prime Minister of Australia, the first time I met a PM, was Bob Hawke, shows my age. Uh, I was in board shorts and a T-shirt, had a donut in one hand and a drink in the other, wasn't expecting to meet the Prime Minister, mind you. Uh, and all of a sudden, I was just a, I was a young fella at this stage as well. All of a sudden, there's this old bloke who I didn't recognise. And TV cameras all around. And he sticks out his hand and he says, G'day, young fella. And so I'm like, okay, TV cameras. Kind of hold the drink and the donut in one hand. I'm like, hello, shake the hand. Uh, my granny was watching uh, on the ABC. Uh, we were in Darwin at the time. She was in Adelaide. And she rang my mum, mortified that I would meet the Prime Minister in board shorts with a donut in my hand <clears throat> and not, you know, with some sense of protocol and decorum. Uh, but this is the kind of way we, as Australians, 
like to think about authority figures, you know, that egalitarian flat kind of structure of leadership. Uh, we nickname all of our prime ministers because they're just like us, don't you know? Uh, we don't like the protocol, we don't like the pomp, we don't like the circumstance. And we also like to treat God like this, where we think, oh, well, I will approach God on my terms. Uh, I, I, treating him as an equal, as such, because, you know, flat, egalitarian kind of structure. Uh, <clears throat> if, God, if God wants a relationship with me, he can do so on my terms. I'm not going to, like I would if I was meeting the queen or now the king, uh, have to conform to a particular way of approaching royalty. Uh, no, 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 no. I am going to sit in the seat of judgment over God and he can relate on my terms. I don't care what he requires of me. I'm going to tell him what I require of him. Oh, God, you want me to worship you? You better line up. I could never worship a God like X or, you know, dot, dot, dot. Totally inverts uh, the truth of who God is and how we as humans relate to him. The truth is God has requirements of who can approach him. It's not about how we dress. It's not even about the formalities and the, you know, the, the pomp and the, the processional of it all. It is about the state of our hearts. And this is what King David is trying to show. He says, who can dwell in your tent? Who can live on your holy mountain? This is who. The one who lives blamelessly. I mean, that just strikes us all off straight away, right? Practices righteousness. I mean, we can practice, but that's not what he means here. He doesn't mean like practice as in giving it a go and getting better. He means the one who walks in righteousness. Acknowledges the truth in his heart. Meaning, to know the truth and then do the truth. Who doesn't slander with his tongue, doesn't harm his friend, or discredit his neighbor, despises the one rejected by the Lord, but honors those who fear the Lord, keeps his word whatever the cost, doesn't lend his silver at interest or take a bribe against the innocent. Man, uh, you may not be disqualified on all of, those, all of those counts, but at least even just the very first one, which is probably why King David starts there. The blameless one can approach you. Well, okay, that basically does us all in. But just in case you thought you were also blameless, uh, the one who walks righteously, the one who acknowledges the truth in his heart, who understands. He gives us this list. And again, what we want to do is understand it in its original context and then understand it in light of Christ. So to the original readers, and for, and for King David, this reads at his reads as a display of God's righteous requirements, something that we aim for. This is the standard for God. It's like a distillation of the law. David's saying, here is the, not just the ideal person, the exemplar, but here is God's standard. Here's the, like the if you like, the moral threshold we've got to climb over to be able to approach God, to be able to ascend his hill, his mountain, and dwell with him. When we miss the mark, so here's the mark, when we miss the mark, that is what we call sin. Sin is missing the mark. We sometimes think about sin as in sins, so individual sins. So this is a sin, or that's a sin, or, or this thing's a sin, or this is a really bad sin, and this is a really good sin, but the way that Scripture talks about sin is, here is the mark, here's the bullseye, here's the target, and when we stray from that target, yeah, we might miss by a lot, or missed by a little, but when we miss the mark, that is sin. Sin literally is missing the mark. And so we're given the mark, we're given the aim. But who can fulfill these characteristics? Nobody. Let's just look at them just briefly, one by one. Uh, blameless doesn't perhaps need much explanation. Someone who, ha who has no blame. Someone who hits the mark who hits that bullseye day in and day out. Blameless is the person who can approach the king. Now, just because we're all disqualified at that uh, mark doesn't mean that we shouldn't aspire to that mark. Just because we go, well, we, we know we can't hit the bullseye every time, 
So why try? That's, that's not what King David is trying to uh, help us understand. He's saying, no, 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 we, we aim for that mark. Practices righteousness, does everything right. Lives as Yahweh would live if he were among us. Acknowledges the truth in his heart, doesn't slander with his tongue, doesn't harm his friend or discredit his neighbor. Since this is somebody who knows the truth, knows the reality of things, knows, can discern not just right from wrong, but true from false, and then lives congruently with the truth and speaks congruently with the truth. Man, this is one of the things that I think, I mean, I obviously didn't live 3,000 years ago, uh, but it must have been something that people weren't doing in the time to make it something that David would comment on. In our day today, I'm still amazed, not just at you know, those people out there, but even for, for me living my life, at the times I'm tempted to, I know the truth, but the pressures from outside to, to not necessarily say something that's not true, but to not say something that is true, man, there's a lot of demand for that. There's a lot of pressure for that. And David says, who is the one who can ascend the hill, the one who knows the truth and speaks the truth? In fact, he goes on to say, <clears throat> if this person who can ascend the hill says that they are going to do something, they will do it no matter the cost. That is how committed this person is to the truth. No matter the cost. There's no, well, I just won't commit to anything so that I don't have to, uh, you know, break my word. Uh, they say, no, no, this is the truth. I'm speaking the truth. I'm going to do this thing or I believe this thing or this is the thing. And no matter what the cost, they stand firm in that thing. So if someone says, I'm going to be there, someone says, I'm going to pray for you, someone says, I will buy this thing or sell this thing or do this thing or, or be there, whatever it is, even if circumstances change later, the person doesn't need to make an oath, they don't need to make a promise, they don't need to swear on a Bible or do any of those things because the truth in their heart that comes out from their lips is the thing that's going to happen so far as it is up to them. Despises the one rejected by the Lord. Oh, sorry, we didn't go about slander. Slander with his tongue. Doesn't harm his friend or discredit his neighbor. The slander with the tongue, man, I read a, um, actually I was reading uh, Charles Spurgeon's sermon on this passage. And he said, man, the one who, like a, like a person who receives stolen goods is just as, uh, accountable to the law as the one who stole those goods, so too is the person who hears gossip and re or receives gossip is also, or slander, uh, is just as accountable as the one who spreads the gossip. And so here he's saying, man, the person who is righteous before God, who is blameless, who is worthy to ascend the hill and dwell with the Lord, is a person who's in control of their tongue, who doesn't harm his friend or discredit his neighbor. This person is living according to the truth that is inside them. Who despises the one re rejected by the Lord and honors those who fear the Lord. So loves what God loves and rejects what God rejects. This is the kind of person who is worthy to approach the king. Again, who keeps his word whatever the cost. Uh, his or her word is their seal. They don't need to make promises. Their word is their promise. Two more things. Who doesn't lend his silver at interest. Now, this, they're not David here, I, I think, and according to everyone who I can find uh, who speaks on it, isn't talking about doesn't use their money to make money. They're talking specifically about when someone's in need, then they say, well, I can help you meet that need, but you're going to have to pay me back with interest. They're not talking about someone who is trying to, you know, wants to 
buy a field or buy a cow or whatever it is uh, and, and make money. They're not talking about, uh, an, in an economic sense, they're talking about in a justice sense, in an aid sense, in a helping sense. We see a brother or a sister in need saying, well, the upright person isn't the one who goes to them and says, well, I can help you out, but then it's really a stitch up because you're going to be indebted to me forever. But rather, who is generous. And then lastly, who won't take a bribe against the innocent. Somebody who stands in a position of authority or power or some sort of influence. And again, the, they are committed to the truth. Even if it costs them dearly, or even if they, it costs them a potential benefit like receiving a bribe. Now, over and over and over again, the man and woman who loves God and the things of God, justice, righteousness, truth, generosity, integrity, we're actually seeing over and over and over again are just echoes of the character of God. Who can ascend the hill? Who can approach the king? Who can go and be with God is the one who is like God. That's what we're hearing over and over and over again. David shows us, if we ask the question, this most important of questions, then he answers the question and shows us God's righteous requirement and inherently our inability to fulfill it. So what are we supposed to do? How do you read a psalm like Psalm 15 and say, well, what are we supposed to do? He doesn't say it's the one who aspires to be blameless. It's the one who aims for blamelessness. Can it send the hill? It doesn't say that. It doesn't say the one who aspires to righteousness, who aims for righteousness. He didn't say that either. The one who is righteous. It doesn't say the one who wants to live according to the truth. It says the one who does live according to the truth. Man, it's, this is tough. How do we, this is how David puts it. In another psalm, Psalm 24, it says very similarly, it says the earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants belong to Yahweh. For he laid its foundations on the seas and established it on the rivers. So he's firstly establishing the majesty and the authority of God to make the decisions, to actually say there, to say I make the rules. You want to approach God, you want to be right with God, David's helping us to understand, well, God is the one who, again, breathes and creates everything we know. And then he goes on, Psalm 24, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He asks the same question. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not appealed to what is false, who has not sworn deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation, such as the generation of those who inquire of him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob, Selah. So he helped us in Psalm 24 to understand how are we to approach, if we cannot fulfill even the first of these qualifications, let alone all of them, how are we to do it? He gives us the answer in Psalm 24. It says, the one who lives like this, he will receive blessing from the Lord he will receive righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is where we have the benefit of living after Jesus. We can ask, how do we understand this psalm in light of Jesus? Because he is the one who was and is blameless. He is the one who was perfectly righteous. He's the one who lived perfectly according to the truth, no matter what the cost. He is the one who did what he said he was going to do. He's the one. And he is the one who physically, like literally climbed the hill with timber on his back that he'd later hang on. And because he was the perfect righteous one because he died the death that we deserved and imputes to us or fulfilling Psalm 24 gifts to us righteousness from the God of our salvation blessing from Yahweh 
Jesus becomes not just our example. He is our perfect example. But he's not just our perfect example. He is the one who imputes his own righteousness to us. He's the one who gifts to us the perfect fulfillment of all of those qualifications so that we might respond to God's invitation, climb the hill and dwell with him forever. Psalm 15, Psalm 24, <clears throat> these are, on the one hand, uh, devastating psalms in our, in our own strength and really wonderful psalms in light of Jesus. That's not to say that <clears throat> uh, now that we have Jesus, we don't have to try to hit the mark. Uh, now we have, we have Jesus' imputed righteousness and we have his perfect example. So like Peter says, we can trace over the outline of his life and live as he lived. Because we've been gifted the Holy Spirit, we are now able to, uh, want to live a life pleasing to God and able to live a life pleasing to God. And David finishes the psalm with this thought. He says, the one who does these things will never be shaken. I don't know if you've ever thought about the possibility of living an unshakable life. Or if you know people who, like you hear that thing about, you know, they know the truth and they, they are, they have a, they're firmly planted in the truth. Or like some, uh, one talks about being a tree um, planted next to streams of living water and growing roots down deep so that no matter what storm or drought or um, whatever the weather's doing, you have life that can't be taken away, you have roots that are deep in the truth. And you think, man, I'd love to live a life like that. I'd love to be able to know the truth and then live in light of the truth. I'd love to be a person of my word no matter what I say. I do that thing no matter what the cost. And what David's helping us understand is he asks the question, he tells us, the answer, and then at the end he says, there's like his promise, he says, if you do live like this, you'll be the kind of person who will live an unshakable life. Unshakable because you're on the mountain with God. Unshakable because you don't compromise on the kind of person that God is calling you to be. Unshakable because you fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith, tracing around his example. And for us, we want to trace like, you know, with, with all of our effort, with all of our life, and we fix our eyes on him means to get rid of every other distraction. Unshakable because we anchor our hope and our life on the unchanging holiness of God's ways. We don't toss to and fro based on the ever-changing winds of culture, which tell us, what to think or what's the latest way of us being self-determinant and sitting in the position of judgment over God and deciding on how we're going to approach God. Those ideas change from generation to generation. But God doesn't change from generation to generation. He's holy. He's faithful throughout the generations. And he is inviting us to come to him. What does your life look like when shaken becomes unshakable? Doesn't mean that all of a sudden circumstances become very easy for you. Doesn't mean that all the lights turn green just as you get to the intersection. Doesn't mean you're not going to get sick. <clears throat> Doesn't mean that you're not going to lose a job or lose a relationship or lose a loved one or lose your own life. What it means in, is that in every circumstance and situation, you are anchored to the firmest of foundations. It means you, you have a hope that can't be taken away. It means you have a joy that can't be taken away. You can't. You can live an unshakable life. In fact, Jesus, is, the King, is inviting you to come and live this way of life. His 
pray together. Father God, I want to thank you for, again, for these scriptures, a short psalm, but a most important question. Who can dwell in your tent? Who can live in your holy mountain? Father, we, as we look to the perfect example of Jesus, who was blameless, righteous, acknowledged the truth in his heart, never slandered, kept his word, even at such a great cost, was a friend to the outcast. Father, we, we want to be just like Jesus. Thank you that even though we don't still live up to your perfect righteous requirement, uh, that all of our, the ways that we miss the mark are covered by the precious blood of your son, Jesus. Thank you that you don't treat us or relate to us according to our sin, but according to Jesus' perfection. God, you're so good to us. And so please help us to be attentive to your spirit in step with your Holy Spirit as we think and make decisions and as we speak, as we relate to you and relate to others, as we go about our work, go about our lives. Father, help us to become more like Jesus, to live more like Jesus and love more like Jesus, think more like Jesus. Help us to fix our eyes on Jesus and trace our lives around his example. Lord, be glorified among us and I just want to ask that we would be a community, a family who are unshakable, that hold your truths in our hearts and only speak the truth. That we don't need promises or oaths because our word is our seal, no matter what the cost. That we can example after Jesus and reflect you to the world. And Father, that we live on that hill with you forever. You're such a wonderful, loving, merciful God and King, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.